Uh, welcome to String of Pearls, Provo River Del Delta Restoration, and the other mitigation commission projects that link Provo, uh, with, Provo River with Salt Lake County. With us today, we have Melissa Stamp. Uh, Melissa is the project manager for the Utah Reclamation Mitigation and Conservation Commission. So she's going to save about five minutes for questions at the end and take it away. Well, thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. It's been a few years since I've been able to attend a symposium, and it's nice to be kind of fully back in person once again. Um, so what I'll be kind of talking about today, I'll start with an overview, tell you a little bit about our agency, um, kind of help you understand what the heck this string of pearls things is that I'm talking about in the title of the presentation. I'll spend the bulk of the time today on the Provo River Delta Restoration Project and then wrap up by touching on some of the other conservation projects our agency has been involved in that kind of create that linkage from Provo River to Salt Lake County watershed. So I probably should have started the, pro uh, the presentation with a pretty picture of one of our restoration projects, but it's Throwback Thursday, so I thought I'd start with this kind of wonky, nerdy photo of a signed 30-year-old piece of legislation. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is a signed copy of Public Law 102575, which is the Central Utah Project Completion Act. And this is the legislation that created the agency I work for. Um, it authorized the completion of the Central Utah Project, which is a big federal water project that built some of the dams and water diversions and pipelines that essentially allow Utah to harness its share of Colorado River water. Um, and it also, as I said, created the Mitigation Commission, the agency I work for. Um, and this CUPCA recently celebrated its 30th anniversary. The bill was signed back on October 30th, 1992 uh, by George H.W. Bush four days before he lost the election to Bill Clinton. Um, I'll date myself by sharing that that's the second presidential election I voted in. Anybody here remember Ross Perot? This is definitely a throwback Thursday moment. Yes, some people do have that in their memories as well. So kind of just some history about uh, as we listen to Professor Abbott this morning, there's been a long history of water development in Utah. This is kind of the relatively modern version of the federal uh, efforts that have been done in Utah. And our agency's responsibility is to mitigate and do the environmental side um, of these water projects. Um, and I'll ask for a raise of hands. Who here has heard of the Mitigation Commission before today? Quite a few people. That's good. That's why we come to these conferences. We're a pretty poorly known agency overall, um, and we don't even have, you know, we got way too long of a name, and it doesn't even turn into a catchy sounding acronym. Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of why I want to kind of share a little bit with you all about what we're about. Um, you know, we're not a state agency, but yet our name starts with the, the word Utah, so that'll fool you. Um, we're also not part of Bureau of Reclamation, even though Reclamation's in our agency name and I have a reclamation email account address. Um, we're not even technically part of Department of Interior. We have a very short chain of command. We have an executive director who reports to uh, five commissioners that are appointed by the president. Um, our budget does come through Interior, though, so we kind of functionally are uh, associated with DOI. Uh, we're a small executive branch agency of the federal government. And again, really our name, although it's long and confusing, we mitigate the reclamation projects, and we do conservation, and we are a commission. Um, so that's kind of what we're about. I also want to mention we have a small staff. We have 12 people on our staff. And so really the only way our agency has been able to complete projects like the ones I'll tell you about here today are through partnerships. And this is a list from our annual report of all these different entities that we've had uh, funding agreements or other partnership arrangements with over the agency's history. Uh, the ones, the logos on the left are some of our key partners with the Delta Project. There are many more even just beyond those uh, logos that are shown there, however. I also want to highlight that uh, our staff um, was involved in creating many of the slides I'll share here today, so much credit goes to them and acknowledgement. Um, so this is kind of a little bit of a map of what we do. There's a lot going on here. I'll kind of walk you through it. It's showing two of the central Utah watersheds where our agency does work. Um, a couple things to point out here. The north arrow is aiming to the left. Um, so we're tilted on our side, which is a little confusing. We'll get your brains going this morning. Um, this star is where we are right here today, approximately, at the, the cultural center. 
um, in West Valley. That's Great Salt Lake and Utah Lake. So that kind of helps you orient yourself. And then these pink circled areas are the four conservation and mitigation projects that I'll be touching on today. And this idea with the pearl thing, um, the idea is that these individual uh, conservation open land properties that are preserved can be linked up by a string that provides some habitat connectivity. And it's a little bit of maybe a cheesy analogy, but the thing I like about it is that it frames these things as something valuable, <laughs> um, which I think we lose sight of a lot of the time. So that's the idea of the string of pearls. So the first one I'll talk about is located here. And little Q&A here. Who can tell me why the heck I have these silly little cartoon lollipops on this pearl? You guys knew who our agency was. I'm pushing you now. Oh, we might have to go to Beck. Oh, yeah, to you. The June sucker. Those are suckers, not lollipops. Those are the June sucker. Exactly. Yes. And so our, our talented public information officer made this cartoon, June sucker, wearing a necklace. It does have big fleshy lips. Doesn't usually wear lipstick. This is what it actually it looks like in real life. Um, but yeah, the Delta Project, at its heart, the need, underlying need for the project is to help recover the June sucker, which is a fish that was on the federal endangered list. It's now been downlisted to just a threatened status, so it's improving. Um, and it's a fish that's endemic to Utah Lake, only place on the entire planet this fish naturally occurs. And it's uh, been something that has been through the ringer over its lifespan history. Um, you know, population used to be in the millions. And June sucker and some of the other native fish that were originally in Utah Lake provided food for the various Native American tribes that lived around and visited Utah Lake dating back more than 10,000 years. Um, and as we heard this morning, the, this very tiny window of the last 150 years about um, with pioneer settlers in Utah Valley, we've really lost the population of that fish. It, it got uh, down to only about 300. Uh, adult spawner individuals in the 80s when it was listed as endangered. And the cool thing is that since that time, through the efforts of the June Sucker Recovery Program, which kind of this multi-agency umbrella organization that this Delta project is being done under, um, has brought back the population up to about 50,000 plus estimate of adult spawning fish. And a lot of that is through a success successful hatchery program. Um, but we're still at a point where we aren't able, the fish is not able to uh, complete its whole life cycle successfully on its own. And that's because of this bottleneck in habitat. So there are many things that led to uh, June sucker population dropping and it becoming endangered. One of them was levying off and dredging the uh, lower Provo River. And so it was really kind of this bathtub habitat that made the young fish, the, the June sucker lives most of its life cycle in Utah Lake. It uh, swims up the tributaries in the springtime to spawn. And then these tiny larvae drift downstream and they don't have great swimming capabilities. And so in this kind of dredged bathtub environment, they were very vulnerable to predation. There wasn't a lot of food for them. And so this Delta Project effort is really tried to address that bottleneck and create some of that critical rearing habitat with the efforts of June sucker, these fish come up every spring and spawn, but they aren't living uh, to, to grow up and recruit on their own. So that hatchery supplementation is how the population's been increasing. So that's kind of uh, the underlying need, why our agency and these other partners have spent so much effort on the Delta Project um, over the last decades. So um, down here, uh, this is kind of an overview of the, the project area, and it's located at the mouth of Provo River, which I'll point out down here. That's the original levied section here um, down near Utah Lake State Park. And our project involves diverting the majority of the river's flow into this new constructed delta with braided channels and ponds. We also lowered the north half of Skipper Bay Dyke to allow Utah Lake to expand eastward and reoccupy something closer to its historic shoreline. 
Um, part of the project also invo involves building various trails and recreation features. Um, and that older section of channel that we've now diverted most of the flow away from will continue to receive a small amount of flow. And again, the idea is to create this nursery rearing habitat for the June sucker. They need cover from predators. They need food to grow and survive. Um, and the idea is this is going to be mostly wet, even during summer low lake conditions. And we're trying to create that missing pondweed, aquatic type vegetated habitat, and the bulrush, the emergent vegetation as well. Um, this is some images from Provo Bay and from the mouth of Hobble Creek, where a similar, much smaller restoration project was done nearly 15 years ago. So some idea of kind of the vision for what we were trying to create. And now I've got a sequence of the construction of the project, which started in March 2020, when some other bad things started. <laughs> but this was a good thing that started in March. But it will be easy to remember when this project started construction. Um, by November of that year, you can see along the west side of the project near the lake, we started kind of at the downstream end and worked upstream. You can see that network of braided channels and ponds and riparian mounds that were under construction. You can also point out kind of an interesting thing. There's kind of this ribbons of uh, kind of tan colored things here. Those are swamp map roads uh, aligned along the, the where we were going to uh, dig out the next set of channels. And those are timber mats that allow heavy equipment to get out into this area that was a wetland and access um, the areas where they're going to dig. So we kind of leapfrogged our way through and continued that work. Um, here's some images of, of construction underway, digging those ponds and channels, lowering the dike and building the outlet channels, and then shaping that new river section up closer to where we were going to divert the river. A lot of bioengineered bank work that went into this project as well in that riverine section where there was more of a, a high energy system. These are some of the UCC crew and our interns that did a lot of the work on that. Most of the construction was completed by Bureau of Reclamation's construction crew. Um, and then by last year, about this time, you can see all the channels and uh, ponds were completed. We've got kind of that lighter colored section here is where we were doing those bioengineered banks and some cobble in the channel bed. That's why it's kind of that light color. And then the really cool thing that happened in March of this year was actually connecting the river. Um, and so we were able to put the water into the new delta this spring. And this is what it looks like now. Um, I spent years with working on the designs and looking at this going, it's going to be really wet. People would be like, how many trails can we have out there? I'm like, it's going to be really wet. Um, and, and then we kind of did it. And I was like, holy cow, it's really wet. <laughs> and, and of course, it was also an epic water year this year. And the lake came up like seven feet. It was kind of unbelievable how high the lake got, given how low it had been uh, the, the, the fall prior to that. So um, it filled up quickly. And uh, you can see we also had created some of these riparian mounds, which the, the design team that was uh, building, designing the project was like, we need some higher areas. Or when the lake's high, it's going to be kind of like all open water. And you're like, oh, glad we put those in. <laughs> um, so this is another image kind of looking south more obliquely. This is a Utah by air image. Um, and it, it just is it's a beautiful habitat. And um, kind of you can see the, the dike being partially, the lower dike being partially inundated and that new connection we've created. And you know, versus kind of this tree line section of the very narrow channel um, where the, the water was going before the project. These are just some before and after um, from some cameras we have out there. Again, just this was 260 acres of agricultural land that we acquired for the project. And it had been grazed um, and pastures. And the dike, the diking that had been done was how that was possible, because this area was below a high lake level. Um, and it was just diked off and pumped out to be dry enough for, for ranching. So this is just another sequence there. And gosh, the fish liked it. We knew they would, but you're, you're always a little nervous. Um, so this spring, over 6,000 tagged adult June sucker were detected, utilizing the delta and moving upstream to spawn higher up in the Provo River this spring. Um, and that is only a small percentage of all the adults that we expect uh, went up and spawned and worked their way through the delta. 
We found the larvae, so they successfully laid eggs that hatched into larval fish. And more recently, um, the Division of Wildlife biologists have also found young of year, what is what they call the, the small June suckers that were spawned this spring. Um, not in enormously high numbers, but they are there. And so we will continue tracking, and there's a lot of monitoring work going on uh, to kind of see how things play out and whether we've successfully kind of eliminated one of those key bottlenecks in their life cycle. So just some pictures of the project coming to life. It's been a neat project to be involved with, and it's just kind of an amazing place in terms of the habitat that's been created. But we're not done yet. So we opened to the fish this spring when we connected to the water, but we're not open to the public yet. One cool thing about the project, again, we're a federal agency. We purchased the land. Um, for the project, we will be transferring it to the state, Division of Wildlife for long-term management, probably next year or the following year, once we're all done with construction. And eventually, it is intended to be open to the public. Um, but we have a lot of work to do still. Um, we're still doing a lot of revegetation. Crews are out there today and have been for a lot of the month of November. Seeding happened, and now we've got 96,000 plantings going in of native plants just this fall alone, and we did, on average, it's been like 75,000 each year. So a lot of effort into the revegetation, and that's partly to kind of stave off all of the invasive plants like Phragmites, which we've been treating over time each year as well. This is just some of the trails and recreation features, some images of, of what we're working on for that. There's gonna be fishing platforms and boat launches for non-motorized boating, interpretive signs and a viewing tower. Um, a lot of work still happening in the original channel, which we're trying to maintain as a, a community amenity. We piloted an aeration system in there uh, this, this year that will expand most likely next year to protect water quality. With that small amount of flow being all that we're able to deliver down there, we've ponded that original channel so that it acts more like a long linear pond. It can be a community fishery. A um, lot going on. Also, I mentioned we're in like the historic lake bed here. And so to build this small dam and our diversion structure, which have concrete elements, you first have to pile it up with a lot of weight um, and pre-settle, kind of do a settlement period, because it's just really mucky substrate down there. And so that's why kind of these things linger, and you have to let it settle for months and up to a year before you can finish things. So this is a lot of the work that still needs to be done. Um, this is just a slide talking about ways that you can get involved, um, and I'll have some of this information on my finishing slide as well. Um, but there are a lot of ways that you can connect with the site. We have been doing second Saturday site tours that'll start up again next April if anyone wants to come see the project before it is open to the public. Um, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, shifting a little bit away from our, our Delta project, I did want to also mention the string part of the uh, string of pearls that our agency has been involved with, and that is the water, the in-stream flow water. And historically, Provo River was often fully diverted in late summer during the height of the irrigation season, particularly in dry years. And again, this June Sucker Recovery Program, one of the big things they've invested in, millions and millions of dollars in, is flows to support the springtime spawning run and now also summertime base flows, which are very helpful for fishing and other types of recreation regardless of June sucker. I'll also mention one of our other little pearls. This is a really hard question. Becca's here, she might know the answer to this one, but anyone else, why am I have a frog up on this pearl? Not boreal toads, but you're on the right track. Columbia spotted frog, yes. The, the middle Provo River, which also has a lot of great fishing. Um, between Jordan L Dam and Deer Creek Dam is another big restoration project that our agency uh, led out on. Um, and this is a river that was restored after being channelized and diked in the 50s and 60s, partly in, due to flooding induced by all this imported water that we were bringing in from other basins. And that had a lot of habitat impacts that led to this middle Provo River restoration project. And so we removed those dikes, widened out the floodplain, re-meandered re the channel, um, also removed some diversion structures that were uh, blocking fish passage, and this also had an in-stream flow component to it. Um, so this gives you an idea, again, of that narrow levied channel, 
and then the middle Provo restoration restored this much wider floodplain. And in this image, you can kind of see this is the alignment of the pre-project channel um, where we've done a lot more habitat diversity with remeandering and creating these side channel habitats and so forth. So that's the middle Provo, Provo River Restoration Project. Great for fish, fishing and also recruitment for some of our native riparian species. Okay, I got a bird on this pearl. Any guesses? It's getting harder. I don't think anyone's, so everybody here go up to our table that talks about our Jordan River properties. Um, when you go up the stairs, take a hard right, and we have a table that talks a little bit more about our Jordan River properties. This is a, a portion of uh, lands that our agency purchased for conservation known as Jordan River Migratory Bird Reserve. Um, it's about 100 acres, and Eric McCauley on our staff has been working really hard both to improve habitat out there, reduce the weed problems, uh, get a lot of volunteers and school groups and entities involved with the project and restoring it um, and maintaining the restoration. This is Willow Creek, one of the Salt Lake County streams um, that feeds into the Jordan River. And this is work that wasn't on the Jordan River property, but on its floodplain where Willow Creek comes in. And we've been in communication. This is kind of, our, our agency is not intended to manage land long term. We are in, actually intended to sunset once the Central Utah project is fully complete. And so one of the things we're trying to do is figure out entities that will take on and manage these properties uh, in perpetuity. So we've been having conversations with Jordan River Commission, Forestry Fire State Lands, um, and we also have other Jordan River properties. So if anyone would like a conservation property, also find us at the table up there. <laughs> um, we should talk. So last pearl has a salt shaker. This one's easier, actually. What's that one about? Where would a salt shaker conservation be? Great Salt Lake, I'm hearing it. Yeah, shorebirds are also happening here. So this is the Great Salt Lake South Shore Preserve. This is one of the projects our agency is a mitigation commission, but also a conservation agency. And this is where we've been more in a support role all along. Um, mitigation commission did purchase uh, some of the properties and easements that are part of National Audubon Society's Gilmore Sanctuary. And we are right now, we're just about wrapped up with uh, a NEPA effort, and we'll be transferring deeds to Audubon for their continued long-term management. They've been managing this property all along on the south shore of Great Salt Lake. Sometimes our agency kind of acts like more of a nature conservancy in that way. Um, many mitigation commission projects are poorly known, but we're in the mix in more than you might realize in the state. And I kind of just wanted to wrap up with some thoughts about why these pearls matter. Um, and I think, you know, I've got the big subdivision, generic subdivision photo here from the internet on the slide. And as we know, Utah is one of our fastest growing states in the country. I've been with this agency for about eight years. And it's not surprising, but it is still a little bit shocking to watch development creep right up to the edge of our conservation property borders, particularly on the Jordan River properties. You know. Oh, that used to be a fence and an agricultural pasture, and now it's this giant 20-foot high concrete retaining wall holding up a new apartment complex or a new hotel. And so it's very clear that if our agency wasn't in the mix acquiring these properties 20-some years ago, they would be developed. Now, there's not a lot standing in the way. Uh, Utah, as a state, doesn't have shoreline protection laws like some other states do. Um, I'm excited to see there's, I think, on the schedule some talks this afternoon about riparian conservation and maybe some new policy push to do something a little bit more like that. Um, I'm hopeful that that's the case. Um, and I think, so it's, it's very important or we, we, we'll lose them. So it's important that we had these conservation pearls <laughs> uh, connected. I also think that one of the things our agency has done, and, and I'm being a little facetious about, if you want a conservation property, come talk to us. But part of why that's hard is that, um, again, I like this string of pearls thing that we, we talk about it as a positive thing. You know, if you have a string of pearls in your family, it's a family heirloom that you want to treasure and maintain and pass on um, to the future. And I think a lot of times we talk about these things as 
a liability, a wildfire hazard, a nuisance, there's mosquitoes, all the negative things that come with these. But I, I like the idea of, let's think about them as an heirloom. Um, these are spaces that clean our air, um, hold our floodwaters like a sponge, um, give us some of that cooling evaporative effect, and kind of as Professor Abbott was alluding to this morning, it, it's about us. <laughs> like these give us an amazing amount of services. These are our green infrastructure. We as uh, uh, entities and kind of need to make sure that we're funding the ongoing maintenance of these areas the way we also fund things like roads and things like that and recognize that they're a beneficial thing that is helpful to invest in. So those are just some thoughts about um, the string of pearls idea and our agency and what we've accomplished over the years. Again, check out our mitigation commission table, hard right when you go up the stairs. Check out our website, and I think I have some time for questions. Yeah. Yeah, good question. The question was whether we've been tracking CARP and how that's progressing in the Delta area. And the answer is yes, we are paying attention to the CARP. We don't have trackers on the CARP as far as I know, um, but there are definitely plenty of CARP in there. One of the things we did, as I mentioned, we partially lowered, we did not completely lower the dike. Um, and part of the reason to partially lower it was so that we could have water uh, in, the, in the delta even when the lake gets super low. Um, so kind of cutting off some of the wider fluctuations that the full lake uh, experiences. But the other good thing about having those outlet channels, we have some kind of ugly looking concrete blocks on either side. But the idea is when the lake is low, you'd be able to string a picket weir across there and block adult fish migration. And that's an opportunity for the biologists to really maybe get in during carp uh, uh, spawning season or something like that and really target and remove some of those fish. And the carp don't eat the June sucker per se, but they dig up a lot of that plant uh, aquatic rooted vegetation, change water quality, all those fun things. And so it's interesting. We are tracking it. There's some this aquatic vegetation monitoring that Utah State students are doing. Um, and it's all part of the June sucker program is funded a lot of the carp removal. So that will definitely be part of it going on. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, this, I guess thinking about encroachment, are there safeguards in place or plans to preserve connectivity between the pearls? You know, I wouldn't say so specifically um, in the sense that I'm not sure. It's interesting. Our agency kind of was created and we almost inherited this laundry list of tasks related to even prior to kind of first incarnation of Central Utah Project, not just the 90s version. The 50s version was the original version. And so I'm not sure they've been thought of in this very connectivity focused way but very much so the, the in-stream flow component is something that our agency and we partner all the time with Central Utah Water Conservancy District and Department of Interior's Cupca office and very much committed to maintaining that connectivity and it's some of it's required by law. Um, and so as you know, it's always a challenge <laughs> with there's always those threats. Um, I think it actually is a fairly decent corridor. Uh, Jordan River is spotty, I think, as everybody in this conference is well aware, and has been a challenge to make mo more coherent. Um, but that work is ongoing. So I would say there's work ongoing on Jordan River connection piece. And Provo River has you know, th the section where we did the middle Provo River restoration project is connected. Provo Canyon has some protections, Forest Service land, and things like that. But then we have the urban section that I don't think is ever going to be a full green ribbon, but that would be a great vision. <laughs> but there's a lot of development already in there. Yeah, good question. Anyone else? One in the back. Yeah. For bank stabilization. Yeah, out in most of the Delta area, it is lake, uh, kind of lake level, and that lower dike is setting the water level out there. So it's a very low energy, slow moving water environment. And we did not do any bank stabilization there. Um, although we are anticipating a lot of bull rush and things like that, sort of providing some of that stability. And a lot of reveg went into that. 
That section between the diversion and kind of the influence of the backwater is where we did, we did line the majority of those banks with these bioengineered uh, soil lifts, which are a very dense coconut fiber mat with kind of almost, I call them dirt tacos sometimes. It's almost like a burrito. Becca's here. She can tell you all about installing them because she did that a lot this year um, as an intern with uh, an individual placement through Utah Conservation Corps with us. And, and so that, and then you, you poke willow stakes through them to try to get that growing. So the idea is it's not a rocky area, it's the lake bed. And you want the vegetation to ultimately be able to hold the banks together. Um, and you jumpstart that process with these coconut fiber materials that will biodegrade. Good question. All right, well, thank you, everybody.